Welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for signing up to this. This is my first live stream. Um, thank you, Chef Speed, for inviting me to do this. I hope everything goes well. The, my biggest worry today has been the technology. I've got my Belkin Ethernet to Lightning iPhone adapter and all this crazy stuff, and I have my dear friend and videographer, Lori, here helping me. <clears throat> so we're making carbonara. And if anyone has questions, I think they're slightly delayed, but you can type questions and we'll take some time to answer them either in the middle or, or at the end. But, um, and uh, Lori and I, um, we've got plenty of wine here. I've been kind of nervous all day about this. Not because, I do classes all the time. I, my business, Cook with James, I've been doing in-person classes for years, but this virtual thing uh, is kind of new to me. Um, so, uh, but hopefully the connection looks good. Hopefully all of you have your water salted and close to a boil. I don't know how many of you are gonna cook along with me. And by the way, this will be, this video is being recorded, will be archived. You can always go back and watch it again as many, as often as you want. Um, so I thought I'd just talk briefly about the dish carbonara. And you know, growing up in America, we have many different versions. A lot of them have cream added, which is kind of a big faux pas. There are many different theories around um, how the dish originated in Italy and, and when and why. And the Italians love to debate about these things endlessly. Um, let's start with the word <coughs> carbonara. What does the word carbonara mean? The carbonara is technically the wife of the coal miner, who's the, the, the guy who goes into the mines and, and, and comes home and he's got soot all over his jacket. And anyway, so one theory is that, you know, in the early 1900s, early 20th century, that you know, this dish was created by either the wife of the coal miners or, you know, just kind of celebrate them and, and prepare a meal for them at home. <clears throat> the other major kind of theory scenario, which I think is probably more likely, is that the dish originated uh, shortly after World, the conclusion of World War II, when we had a lot of American soldiers stationed in Rome, the region of Lazio, where pretty much every Italian believes, agrees that this dish came from, is, is Rome, Lazio. Um, the American soldiers uh, had a lot of rations, bacon, eggs, K rations, and also fresh bacon and eggs, and would bring them to the, to the Italians and say, hey, cook us something. Um, and so that, that's probably most likely how the dish came about, but no one really knows for sure. But it's been around for, you know, 70 years at least. And uh, there are many other similar dishes uh, uh, that are also Roman that come from Lazio. Um, you know, those cacio pepe, uh, which doesn't have the egg, but has the cheese and the black pepper. There's, there's pasta alla gricia, which, ha which doesn't have any egg, but it has the guanciale. So um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to do like a whole sort of tour of, of Rome because I love these pasta dishes. But the one we're doing today, obviously, is carbonara. So um, why don't we tilt down for a moment and go through our ingredients and see how this works. I've got my cutting board here. Perfect. So, this beautiful piece of cured, you're probably wondering what it is. This, I'll hold this up, is guanciale. And it smells amazing. So guanciale, you can use whatever you have on hand. You can use guanciale, you can use pancetta, or you can use good old smoked bacon. You can put it back up for a minute. And we'll talk about that just for a second, and then we'll get into all this. So guanciale, probably most of you know, it's, um, it's, it's pork jowl from the cheek that's cured. And because the jowl is a muscle that works a lot, um, it has a more pronounced flavor profile. Um, the, the best way I could describe it in English is it's, it's just got a little bit of um, a funk to it, but in the best way possible. But if you can't get guanciale, and I can't always get guanciale, um, pancetta is good. What is pancetta? Pancetta is just pork belly that's rolled, um, salted with herbs and, and cured. Bacon, of course, is usually smoked. It's also from the pork belly and it's usually cut into strips and smoked. And that's fine too, whatever you have on hand. Now, this guanciale comes from the fatted calf if you live in San Francisco um, or if you live up in Napa. They have a, a shop at the Oxbow Market, but they make this themselves and it's really high quality. I'm also carrying for the first time my own guanciale. I picked some up from Mark Pasternak, who owns Devil's Gulch Ranch. Uh, he has lots of uh, pigs. He's at the various farmer's markets, and I 
I have one hanging here in my, my pantry anyway, so we'll check back on that. Um, so we'll get started on that. And I also have um, grated pecorino and parmigiano. Now, most carbonara purists would insist that you go 100% pecorino, sheep's milk cheese. It's a little sharper. But I actually like to do 50-50. But if you don't have any pecorino, yes. We have a volume issue. We have a volume can we issue? Can if everybody can hear? Uh-oh. We're just going to pause for a moment to assess whether or not we have a, an issue here. Okay, we're un, unmuting the microphone again. Can everyone... Okay, Frank says he can hear me all right. Okay, I think it just might be a connection issue. On okay, Anna from Chesapeake just sent a message to everyone. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, Mirko upstairs can hear me, <laughs> right? <clears throat> my upstairs neighbor, Mirko, is from Bologna. And that's not where carbonara came from, but a lot of really incredible dishes and rich pastas are originated in, in uh, Emilia Romagna. Um, okay, so I've got my, so I'm doing 50-50 Parmigiano Reggiano and Pecorino Romano. But if you don't have Pecorino, uh, I, I love Parmigiano. So I've got, look at this beautiful big wedge here. You can see all the little, I mean this, if you can smell this, it's so good. And so this is an important little sub note. Now, many of you, including myself, like these microplanes and they really kind of carry, they turn the cheese into snow. And it's great for topping pastas, but because of what we're doing is we're combining this with the eggs and the black pepper and pasta cooking water, um, this sort of glumps up. So what you want to use is an old school box grater. And you wanna use this side. So you take your rind of parmigiano and you just grind it. You can grind it over a paper towel and it just creates a really nice consistency that won't glump up too much. Okay, we also have egg yolks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make enough pasta for like two servings for this demo. So I like to do two yolks per person. You can do whole eggs too, but the yolks have a lot of flavor. They have the most flavor of the egg. So I, I've sort of changed my tune. I used to do one whole egg and then do yolks. I'm just doing all yolks now. Um, so that's where we're at. And black pepper is also another key ingredient. It wouldn't be carbonata with black pepper and you wanna use freshly ground. So this grinder, I have it on a coarse setting. So it's gonna nice, nice big chunks of pepper because you kind of want that heat. Okay. Everybody have their vino? I, I wish this could be more <laughs> interactive. Um, I wish you all could be here. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, I will be able to offer small group in-person cooking classes, you know, later in the summer. Um, I think that will be a, a definite possibility, but for now, let's, uh, let's do this. Cheers. Mm, that's a good rosé. All right, so let's cut up the guanciale. Now, I'm not gonna use all of this, this is a huge amount, but I wanted to show you the piece. So I just have a sharp knife, and I kinda of go largest, largish chunks. I'm gonna cut those smaller, and I can smell this. It smells really good. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is cut these, I'm gonna cut these down like this, and then I'm gonna cut them the other way into chunks about this size. You don't want them too small. You don't want them too, too large. One of our little stainless steel bowls. Hope everyone's enjoying the nice weather. It's warm in this kitchen. All right. And if you're cooking along, you should have your water at a boil. Okay, I'm gonna do this last piece here. And I'll show you what it looks like. Now normally, you're here in person and I'm just directing and you're doing all the work. This time, I'm doing all the work. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. So pancetta would definitely be a good option, but good, good bacon is fine too. All right, so now I've got my eggs. I'm just gonna kind of whisk them together. These are really nice eggs. And I guess I could have started in, in this bowl, but 
I was nervous getting all this together, so, you know, just pour those eggs right in here into the larger bowl. All right, and then we're gonna add an aggressive amount of black pepper. And you know, I'll give you the recipe for this, but there, there are no real exact ratios. It's, you know, it's a very, oops, very creative dish. And you kind of just do what you want. But I like a lot of pepper. So, see that? We're, so we're kind of making like a, a slurry. And I think I'm gonna get, because I lost a little bit of egg. I'm gonna get one more egg yolk to put in there. Hang on. We're doing this real time, so I'm gonna get one more yolk in there. Take out my white. Oh, shit, lost the egg. Okay. Let's do that again. One more time. Alright, so we'll do one more yolk. But it's about a, it's about a yolk per person. So I like it a little more as creamy as possible. Obviously without the use of cream. James, we have a question. How much cheese should people have? That is a very good question. And I would say, you know, you want, you want to have more cheese than you need because you can almost not have, you know, too much cheese. But definitely at least, you know, for a two-portion serving, I would say, you know, at least half a cup to a cup of cheese. I'd go for a cup of cheese. Um, okay, what happened to my, did I lose my fork? I thought I had a fork here. Oh, there it is. Great, so I'm gonna add that extra yolk. I've got all the black pepper in there. And I'm gonna turn that water back on. I'll turn it back up to full. And now I'm gonna incorporate this cheese. Probably not gonna incorporate, now yeah, I'm gonna incorporate all of it. And it goes. And I'm just eyeballing this. And we're gonna make a slurry. And then what we're gonna do later, once the pasta is mostly cooked, we're gonna ladle in some of that starchy, salty pasta water. And that's really going to make this dish. So look at that. That is a nice, nice slurry. Okay, we're gonna set that aside. And now it's time to go over to our range and take our guanciale and start to render it down. So that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna shift the camera around. This is a very simple dish, but it comes together quickly. Okay, my water is not, yeah, let's go. My water's not quite back to the boil. Oh, we'll talk about pasta next, actually. I didn't talk about pasta. Okay, so what pastas are traditionally used in carbonara? Uh, spaghetti alla carbonara, definitely one that you can use that is used often and often, more often than not. You can use whatever pasta you like, pretty much. Uh, rigatoni is very traditional also in Rome. And also bucatini. And bucatini is one of my favorite pastas. It's the long sort of noodle with the hollow, with the hollow center. And it's a little tricky to cook because it can, once it gets al dente, it can go over really quickly because of that hollow center. But, but I love it. And there are many different brands. Um, the most readily available is uh, Di Cecco. It's one of the oldest pasta making companies in Italy. They still extrude the pasta through bronze dyes, which means that you know it has that nice, coarse texture to pick up the sauce. A lot of the other, you know, less expensive pastas are extruded through Teflon dyes, which just turn into mush, and it's not good for you either to digest when the pasta is overcooked. And there are also brands that are a little more artisan, like Monticelli and Rusticella di Abruzzo, um, and they're readily available in the Bay Area and certainly online. Um, okay, my pasta is almost boiling. I'm just gonna open this. There we go. Are there any other questions or concerns before we... By the way, this is a Blue Star range. Um, really happy with it. Uh, 22,000 BTU burners. Um, really great if you're planning on a remodel or anything um consider consider blue star blue star you can send the check next week please no just kidding 
Just kidding. Okay, I'm gonna drop my pasta in a minute, but right now I'm gonna get my burner going. I've got a large pan. I've had this pan for a very long time. You can tell from the bottom. But I, I like it because it's just got a nice curvature and a lot of volume. I actually bought this pan at a cookware store in Florence called Di Bartolini. I spent way too much money there and had everything shipped back, but I got these. These are called Agnello, and I also have these other pans called Lagostino, which are aluminum, uh, not aluminum. They're stainless steel, but they have an aluminum ply in between, and I actually proudly discovered them 10 years, 15 years before William Sonoma did. All right, so I'm gonna put my guanciale in. William Sonoma used to be my client when I was in advertising. Great company. I'm gonna add, a, this has quite a bit of fat, but I'm gonna add just a little bit of olive oil just to get it going and get it started. And what we're gonna do is render this down and cook it mostly through we're not gonna get it like super crispy. We don't wanna go for that in our carbonara. Uh, we just want it slightly caramelized, I would say. We'll just let that go for a minute. I think we can probably drop our pasta now, and I'm gonna set a timer. So um, you always wanna take the pasta out, usually, um, you know, a minute or two before the package instructions. Uh, but I've cooked uh, the Chaco Bucatini for a long time, and it says nine minutes for al dente, and it's actually pretty darn accurate. So I will set a timer for, for nine minutes. So if you're cooking along with me, go ahead and drop your pasta. And I'm just going to do a modest amount, maybe, I don't know. Typically in Italy, they eat 100 grams a person. Um, you know, the free meal is the first course. Okay, I'm going to turn my heat down a little bit. Let's just look at this for a minute. Okay, good. Maybe I'll drop a little more in here. I hope everyone can hear me okay so far. Get the ratio right. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. So I'm going to drop this in and set a timer. Set a timer for nine minutes. Okay, nine minutes of counting. I have the English Siri. All right. So that is in. I'm going to render these down a little more. And I think, actually, this would be a good point, time, to take any questions. If you have any. I think there's a brief delay, so, you know, input your questions, and Lori and I will try to retrieve them, and... And it uh, looks like I need to refill Lori's wine glass uh, somewhat urgently. And, you know, when this is done, I'd also love to hear from you if you how the dish turned out, if you cooked it, or if you cooked it before, and all those good things. The guanciale smells really good. Now, this is going to release, um, you know, depending on the... the piece of guanciale, it might release a lot of fat, so if it does, you can kind of drain some off. It's good to keep a little bit to coat the pasta noodles. All right, I'm just turning my bucatini. I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit on this and get this a little more crispy. And there is quite a bit of fat, so I think I'm going to just remove when this is done just a little bit of it. Let's see, do we have any? Yeah, the, the video looks pretty good. Okay. Do we just pour off the fat if we're using bacon? Yeah, just pour off the fat. You want to keep a little bit of fat. I'll, we'll, do, we'll do a close up here in a minute. It's a little smoky in here because I don't want to turn the hood on just because it might interrupt the, you hearing me. Okay, I'm going to turn that off. That's pretty hot. Let that cool a minute, and then we'll just um, we'll just use one of these little guys, and we'll we'll take out some of the oil. And the pasta's cooking away, and once it's like three quarters of the way done, there'll be enough starch in that water. So another tip: like any time you're doing a pasta sauce, it could be tomato based, whatever it is. Uh, if your sauce looks a little dry, a little of that starchy pasta water will just like bring it back to life and emulsify it because of the starch in it. Okay, so there's, you can see there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of oil in here.
So I'm going to just drain a little bit of that out, a couple tablespoons. Because we want the fat, but we don't need all of it. We don't want it to be greasy. How cooked should the bacon be? So I would say, let me see if I can bring this up a little closer. You can kind of see um, some of the pieces are a little caramelized. Um, but they're not like dark, they're not dark golden brown. So that's kind of what you're going for. And that, that little bit of oil there, that'll just serve to coat the noodles. And that's just gonna just give a lot of flavor. So, and I like sort of this size pieces. You know, some, some, some cooks like to make it a little finer. Some even go a little larger. Um, but you know, when you're, when you're cooking a dish like this, you wanna think about, okay, you know, how is each bite gonna taste? And, you know, if I'm chewing down on, you know, a piece of guanciale or pancetta or, or bacon, you know, how, how big do I want it? Is it going to be difficult to chew? You know, you want it, eating should be a very pleasant experience. You see my pan is all wonky here. Okay, let me check my timer. Check my timer. Okay, we got about five minutes. So, I'm going to bring my other ingredients over. Another sip of rosé. That was a good rosé. Remember, I've got my slurry, and I'm going to start to add some, a little ladle at a time of, not a ladle, a, a very small amount of pasta water. But I'm going to wait till it gets a little bit closer. And then what we're going to do, there, there are different, so there are different ways to compose the final carbonara. And the way I used to do it with my students was, okay, cook the pasta, toss it over a little heat with the guanciale and the oil, get it coated, and then put it into a bowl. And then mix your egg, slurry, um, pepper, water mixture, so you do it completely off the heat in a separate pan, and it just mitigates uh, the risk of cooking the egg. But I've gone back to doing it in the pan. As long as you let this cool down enough, and, and, the, and the, the way, the technique that really helps allow you to do it in the pan versus a separate bowl, and, and neither way is right or wrong, the addition of the pasta cooking water to create more of a slurry, um, that allows us to go back in the pan and then we don't mess up another bowl and it just comes together really nicely. And then what you wanna do in the pan, and you'll see in a moment when we do this, is it's just really um, kind of whisk it, you know, mix it, mix it really well. In Italian they have a word called uh, mantecare, which I don't think has an exact translation to English, but uh, my understanding is, you know, it's like when you finish a risotto, with butter, you know, you're creating this sort of emulsification of fats and, and creating almost this creaminess without the addition of cream. Well, the same thing with the, with the carbonara. We have the fat from the guanciale and some mantecari at the end with tongs or with a spoon and without the heat, it just toss, toss, toss and add more pasta water as needed to make it creamier and creamier. The goal is to have a really creamy looking, uh, rich sauce. Okay. So, let's add some, let's do this. Let's add a little pasta water to this, right? Okay. I'm just gonna add, again, I'm just eyeballing this. Okay, I'm gonna add a little. That pasta water is like gold. And I'm just gonna mix that up. It's got all that starch. If we added this at the very beginning without the starch, it wouldn't have, form this nice, nice thick sauce. So that's looking pretty good. I think I'm gonna leave that like that until we're ready. Was that one ladle? That was like half a ladle. So, I mean, I'm guessing it was probably, you know, um, a quarter to half a cup. I'm guessing, uh, you agree? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. okay, videographer concurs. That was my question too. On that, all right. Do we have any other <laughs> other questions? We probably have like two, two, two to three more minutes on the pasta. What is everybody drinking? So, yeah, we, we just finished this, but um, what is this? Lori brought this over. It's a rosé from is it is this heirloom cafe mm -hmm. rosé? Okay. We have a lot of rosés. I'm, I'm a big rosé drinker. I drink red wine with food, but I drink a lot of rosé um, throughout the rest of the day. 
no, not throughout the day. I'm just kidding. But <clears throat> I like rosé is just a really nice, light, refreshing drink, especially on a day like this. Any other, any other feedback or questions? Okay, Tony, Tony, we already answered Tony about bacon. Yeah, we just pour off the fat. And I would just cut the bacon, you know, similar size, whatever kind of works for you. Um, Do we have a cowbell? The what? Cowbell. What's a cowbell? Frank would like more cowbell. Oh, cowbell. <laughs> Frank would like more cowbell. <laughs> Frank should be over here doing this. He's a carbonara master. I, I met Julie and Frank because they signed up for a carbonara class for like 10 years ago. And I do it almost the same way, but the addition of the, of the um, pasta water to the slurry is a slight change, as I mentioned. So let me check my timer. How's my timer? Because we want to get the heat back, 31 seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna get the heat back on in this pan and get that oil and that guanciale hot. And then we're gonna start the ladle, not ladle, we're gonna start to use our tongs and transfer this directly from the pot um, to the guanciale. And then we're just gonna to toss it. And that what that happens is that oil and a little bit of pasta water is just gonna coat the noodles. And that's a really important part. So that's getting hot really fast. As soon as that goes off, okay, it's done. So I'm gonna turn off the water and we're gonna go right in. And you can see this pasta is like really al dente. Got a nice heat in the pan. There we go. Ooh. All that pepper going into my eyes. Good. Now again, you can do this with spaghetti or linguine or like I said, the other tradition is rigatoni. I don't want this to stick, so I'm gonna get a little more pasta water in here immediately. Okay. And I'm gonna lower the heat and I'm gonna to top it. I'm going to turn off the heat now. Turn off the heat. So now I'm just I'm just tossing the noodles with all the fat from the guanciale and the oil. The pasta water is helping us do the work. Okay, so we're going to wait. I don't know, probably about 30 seconds, and then we're going to add our slurry to this, and we're gonna keep adding pasta water. So this is like a really critical, exciting stage of making carbonara. We are now composing it. Um, now this would be good, just like it is now. But when we add this slurry, now again, the reason we're waiting a little bit, this pan is still really hot, so we don't want these to scramble. So again, if you felt more comfortable transferring this, to a separate bowl and then adding this, that'd be totally fine. But I'm just gonna do it in the same pan. Watch me screw up, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> because there's some water in here, it's gonna help us a lot. We're gonna keep adding water. Okay, I'm gonna add this right now, here we go. Critical stage. And now we are gonna go around. I'm gonna add some pasta water right away. There we go. And we're just gonna, this is what they call mantecari, mantecari. We're off the heat. And I'm gonna just stir this vigorously, 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 vigorously. This pasta looks really al dente. You see how creamy that looks? No cream in there, it's just pasta water. Okay, it's starting to cook a little. I'm gonna put just a little more water in there. Okay. And then we keep going. Because there's all the heat is in the pan. So the pan now is doing the work. Off the heat. Montecati, Montecati, Montecati. Okay. Look at that. Get that up there. Okay. All right. I think we're ready to plate. So to plate, get a beautiful Italian plate. We'll plate one portion. And I guess if you want to get fancy about it, we could, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna 
Let's keep it simple. This is home cooking. Put that down like that. Get some of that guanciale. Let's see how creamy that looks. A little more guanciale. Okay, and then what I like to do is go over with a little more black pepper. Just a little. And then a little more Parmigiana Reggiana. And that is our dish. I guess I should just, I should try it. Piece of guanciale. And by the way, probably most of you know this, never ever want to eat pasta with a spoon. That is a cultural faux pas. You just got to get good at doing a little swirl. Very al dente, almost crunchy, which is how I like it. All right, we made it. Mm, that guanciale really has a funk to it. You can get it. It's really good. Do we have any uh, questions at this point? We have compliments, James. Oh. <laughs> Where can we get the guanciale? Fat, fat of calf. Um, also, um, Gus's Market sometimes has it from Nyman Ranch. You can probably special order it online. But, uh, but good pancetta, like Framani brand, Paul Bertoli, who used to have um, Oliveto, who started Framani. Um, that's, you're not gonna get the same kind of funk. I wish you could taste it, because it really, it really is an, it, a different kind of a flavor profile. But, um, oh, you know where you, you can get it if, if you have a wholesale license like I do, um, Casa de Case. We don't have it right now though, but they, they import it from Italy, the actual guanciale, it's really high quality. Um, so there, you know, there, there, there are people making it, and I've got some hanging in my, in my basement. Not my basement. I don't have a basement in my, in my pantry. Oh, all right. So everybody heard everything, and this worked. Yeah. Did, did, how many of you actually made the dish in real time? Or are you gonna make it later? It worked. Oh, De De Denise Paulson, did you make it in real time, Denise? Denise, also known as the Honey Badger. Well, we can wrap up or, I mean, I'm happy to hang out and drink a little wine and answer more questions and... People are eating right now. And chat. Okay. Anne is doing this later. Um, Annalisa would like to know if you're doing other classes. You know, this is my first. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, I would like to do other classes for sure. So I, I was talking to Anne at Chef Speed and all the people at Chef Speed, and I know there's somebody already doing a regular paella class, uh, which is one of my specialties, because Spanish cooking, I lived in Spain for many years. Uh, but I was thinking of doing like a kind of a different version of paella, like call it pantry paella. So, you know, whatever you have in your pantry, you have, Canned artichoke hearts, you know, jarred piquillo peppers. I was thinking of doing that. I was also thinking about doing some other regional uh, Italian sauces, pasta sauces. So we could do some of the other ones from Rome, like pasta la gricia and cacio pepe, but also go south to Campania, do like puttanesca. And, you know, because I, I love, you know, sort of telling people the history behind all these dishes and, and how they came about, many of them, most of them out of just pure necessity and availability of ingredients. I mean, there's a reason that a lot of pasta in the south of Italy uh, traditionally doesn't have any egg because eggs were considered to be very valuable, you know? So they just made their pasta with, with water and flour, you know, and semolina and things like that. So um, <clears throat> I love the, the historical components to, to food. Uh, maybe, maybe do a tortilla de patatas, which is like the most, to me, the best egg dish in the world. No other country has 
anything that can, in my humble opinion, or not so humble, rival the tortilla de patatas. It's such a nuanced dish. It's just, I mean, the, 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 the Gallegos who invented it, supposedly, I mean, they're genius because when they came up with that dish, the potatoes had just recently arrived in the new world or from the new world to the old world. And a lot of people, including the French, thought that the potatoes were poisonous and they wouldn't eat potatoes. In fact, Maria Antoinette used to decorate her various wigs and hair pieces with the flowers of the potato, but it was the, it was the Spaniards, <laughs> according to my mother Lola, and I would never argue with Lola, um, <clears throat> were, had the perspicacity to, to figure out the dish tortilla patatas, which is very difficult to make if you don't know how to do it properly. So that, that might be a fun one to do, actually. Um, in oh. fact, I think I will do that. Yeah, a food tour. Yeah, and that and a tortilla you can do in about thirty minutes, so it would be appropriate for a. Yes, does that sound does that sound like maybe a plan? Tortilla de patatas. I even have a tortilla pan. You don't have to have one, but it does take out take away some stress. Okay, we'll give some directions on where where you can get a tortilla pan. <laughs> Spanish table, my friends at the Spanish table. By the way. Um, I get a lot of my product from them. They, they, they have a container arriving tomorrow, so they have a steady supply. And they have three stores, one on 2nd and Clement in the city, uh, one in Strawberry Village in Marin, and one in Berkeley on San Pablo Dam Road. Um, but you know, there's never, there's almost, there's never, I've never found a line there. They're really sanitary, and you can get great products and really reasonably priced wines, paella pans, you know, imported products from Spain, fresh and dried. It's a great, Great experience, and uh, you can get the, you might be able to get the tortilla pan. That's where I got mine, and that's what it does. It makes it very easy when you make the tortilla to do the flip without stressing out. Because if you have a plate on top of a pan, a lot of bad things can happen. That one matches your glasses, also. <laughs> it matches. Yeah, it does match my glasses. <laughs> well, thank you all so much I, i'm so excited for all the support and i want to do more of these uh, hopefully you know this is informative and somewhat entertaining uh would love feedback it's the first one we've done i'm sure we can get better at it um but uh carbonara is one of my favorite dishes and i think I, i'm i'm happy with this batch very happy with it. so i hope yours turned out well too or will turn out well all right well i guess until next time ci vediamo presto va bene